collective time of, of prayer this morning uh, as a church the times in which we live there's just going to be more and more trials and more and more persecution more and more hardships now more than ever, ever we need to come together bind together agree together and pray together and I just want to make opportunity if you have a need this morning we want to gather around you and pray with you and alongside you you don't have to say what's going on God already knows what's happening in your life God knows your situation we just want to come alongside you and encourage you and lift you up and pray with you if you have a need this morning just want to encourage you to just put your hand up we'll make sure you have people around you that are praying with you this morning all right you just being bold and stepping out of your pew and praying for different ones would you join me as we just go to the Lord in prayer this morning Heavenly Father we love you this morning God we know that you hear us your word tells us that we can come boldly before your throne of grace to seek you in our time of need and God we need you today we need you every day God, you're all, already aware of our situation. You know of our need today. You've already made provision for that need. God, we just ask of you this morning. Father, I ask that you would supply every financial material need this morning. God, that you would just open up and release the resources of heaven to supply that which is needed. 
God, I pray for the healing of bodies this morning. God, we thank you that you purchased our healing 2,000 years ago on the cross. Your word tells us that by his stripes we are healed. We are healed physically, we are healed emotionally, and we are healed spiritually. God, we thank you for that healing today. God, I just pray for, for hearts this morning, that you would encourage them, that you would heal the brokenhearted. I pray that you'd mend relationships, heal relationships where there's been a rift and a separation. I pray for a healing in marriages. God, I, I just pray for a coming together of your people this morning. As we look to you, as we fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. God, I just pray that you would do a supernatural work in the hearts and lives of your people this morning. Speak to us through your word and by your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, uh, we are in the book of Corinthians. The last few weeks, we are in the 16th chapter, and Paul gets into the area of giving. Let's read a little bit, and we'll hopefully uh, learn some new things this morning. 1 Corinthians 16, let me start with verse 1. Paul writes, Now about the collection for God's people, do what I told the Galatian churches to do. On the first day of every week, each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with his income, saving it up so that when I come, no collections will have to be made. Then when I arrive, I will give letters of introduction to the men you approve and send them with your gift to Jerusalem. So I've been talking here in this area of giving. You know, and I really don't talk about money and finances a whole lot, but periodically I do. Uh, you know, and I always have to keep in mind, you know, I, I'm talking to a group of people from, you know, those who are brand new in their faith and their walk with the Lord. And some of you are seasoned Christians and have been walking with the Lord for many, many, many years. And then I have all those in between. And so everyone is kind of at a different place in their walk with, with God and at a different maturity level. And so, uh, you know, I want us all to be kind of on the same path and uh, going in the same direction here. And so this is just one of those areas that periodically... Uh, that I talk about, and we're just, uh, Paul mentions it here in Corinthians, so but this would be a good time to kind of bring some things out. So some of this, uh, many of you are familiar with, and many of you, this is brand new to you. Uh, but I want to, uh, it's important to have a, a proper mindset when it comes to money and finances in the life of a believer. It's probably one of the top three things that will affect your life more than uh, other things and issues uh, going on in the world. So uh, I want to give you a biblical mindset when it comes to money and finances. And there are many Christians that have a wrong idea of what money is or what God's purpose with it is. So that's, those are the things that we're talking about. Um, so let me recap just a little bit, get everybody up to speed. Uh, as I said uh, last few weeks, I think you really start to mature as a Christian. You mature in your walk with God as you start to care about giving because giving is an outward action towards others it's about benefiting others helping others uh, selfish people tend to be all about me myself and I uh, and so I think Christians uh, should have be of the mindset of giving should be the most giving people on earth and so we'll continue talking about that I want to be a smart giver um, and not just be careless about it there's a lot of takers in the world how many of you know that there's a lot of takers out there who will gladly just take your money. They will lie to you to get your money. They will tell you made-up stories to get your money. They will play on your sympathies uh, to get your money. And there are people out there that have no conscience whatsoever. They won't think twice about taking every cent you have in the bank, deceiving you out of it. It won't bother their conscience at all. And uh, they will try to, you know, by hook or by crook, uh, take anything that you can that they can get out of you and uh, they just won't lose a, a second's sleep over doing such a thing uh, so I'm all about giving but I want to give intelligently and uh, and I want to give you a mindset when it comes to finances that is based on biblical precepts and spiritual law we uh, read uh, Luke chapter 6 uh, verse 38 Jesus said give and it will be given to you a good measure pressed down, shaken together, 
and running over will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. And so real giving, true giving, spiritual giving requires faith. So we're going to talk about faith in our giving this morning as well. Uh, and once you have the understanding that you and I, uh, we are merely just stewards of God's money. It's not my money, it's God's money. And once you have that understanding and that mindset, it really takes away the covetous side of, of money and you know, being caught up in that. Uh, also, we read Psalm 24, 1. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. Uh, last uh, week, last couple weeks, we've covered some areas when it comes to money and finances. Uh, some problems that can arise when, one, when money has its wrongful place and wrongful priority in our life. If you go against biblical principles uh, in your finances, you're going to find yourself in some hardships that you don't like. <clears throat> you know, there's a lot of people here just in the last eight months that have found themselves out of a job. They weren't able to make their rent or their mortgage payment. Uh, they found themselves going deeper and deeper uh, into debt just to keep their head afloat. And that's a very difficult place to be because it puts a heavy burden uh, on your ability to live. <clears throat> Proverbs 21.20 says, In the house of the wise are stores of choice food and oil, but a foolish man devours all he has. So a foolish person, the Bible says, gives no thought for tomorrow. Uh, and some people have learned the hard way that it is foolish to live paycheck to paycheck, which is what this verse is talking about. A foolish man devours all he has. Uh, and the majority of Americans today in America live paycheck to paycheck. Many of you are living paycheck to paycheck. <clears throat> in fact, for many people, their last paycheck is spent a week before their next paycheck is coming. And they're just trying to, to stretch what they have to make it to payday. Uh, there was a uh, study by the Nielsen Group just done here in the last couple of years that showed 25% of families who make over $150,000 a year are living paycheck to paycheck. 150, over $150,000 a year, 25% of Americans in that group are living paycheck to paycheck. One third of families who make between $50,000 and $100,000 a year live paycheck to paycheck. And between 80 and 90% of all Americans are living paycheck to paycheck. So, you know, it isn't an income problem. America, we're the richest nation on earth. It isn't that we don't make enough money, it's how we use and spend our money that is the problem. Now, as I've said, it is, don't get me wrong, it is not a sin to live paycheck to paycheck. It, there's, you aren't sinning by doing that, but it is foolish. It is not wise. Uh, that's what a foolish man does, the Bible says. And so if you want to get out of that paycheck to paycheck lifestyle, and my wife and I, we have been in that lifestyle. We have, done, we have been there. I don't know about you, but I didn't like it. I didn't like that feeling. I didn't like the pressure. I didn't like the stress. And so we had to make some necessary changes in our finances and in our spending habits. And you will too if you want to get out of that, that pattern. Uh, like I said last week, if you keep doing what you've been doing, you're going to keep getting what you got. And so if you don't like what you got, you're going to have to start making some changes. And so I want to give you some biblical ways to do that uh, and, and change that pattern in your life. <clears throat> How many people would have prepared differently... If you knew a year ago that we would be in this current pandemic, how many of you would change things? I think many, probably 80 to 90 percent of Americans would, <laughs> because if you're living, one of those 80 to 90 percent living paycheck to paycheck, being in this current pandemic, you know the stress and the anxiety that has created in your life currently. Now, are economic downturns a new thing all of a sudden? Not at all. There has always been times of drought or famine here and there. There are times when the stock market is going gangbusters. And there are times when it's pulling back. Uh, you know, we call it a bear market or a bull market. It's a bear market uh, when things are stagnant or, or on the decline. It's like a bear, it hibernates, so it's not doing anything. That's called a bear market. 
It's called a bull market when things are going up. In other words, a bull charges, and so that's the stock market. It's a bull market when everybody's portfolio and <coughs> retirement accounts are, are growing, growing, and growing, and we like that. Uh, same with the uh, housing market. It's a seller's market when prices are going up. It's a buyer's market when prices are staying flat or even on the decline. But my point is, you know that there are times of drought or famine, financially speaking. Well, knowing what we know, is it not wise to prepare for such times? Now, I don't know about you, but I want to be wise. And instead of scurrying around how we're going to, wondering how we're going to get by, you know, that, that kind of uh, living creates undue stress and hardship on your life and in your marriage. But when you live wisely, there's a whole lot more peace in your life. So if you want to, <clears throat> to change, then you need to make the necessary changes. So where do we go from here? Well, let me give you some biblical precepts and principles to live by. And how many of you know when you follow God's precepts, you find that life is just a whole lot more easy? There's a whole lot more peace in your life when you're doing things God's way and not the world's way. The world's way is just full of stress and anxiety and turmoil. Just look at the world. Is it peaceful? Not at all. There's no peace in the world. But it's a great feeling when you're not stressed out. <clears throat> but you're going to have to trust God. You're going to have to trust the biblical principles the Bible gives you to live by. Proverbs 3.13 says this, <clears throat> Blessed is the man who finds wisdom, the man who gains understanding. For she is more profitable than silver and yields better returns than gold. <clears throat> she is more precious than rubies. Nothing you desire can compare with her. Long life is in her right hand. In her left hand are riches and honor. Her ways are pleasant ways, and all her paths are peace. <coughs> all of wisdom's ways, all of his paths are peace. They're peaceable. And wisdom, the Bible tells us, comes from God. It begins <coughs> with God. Proverbs 9.10 The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And knowledge of the Holy One <coughs> is understanding. So, and the fear of the Lord refers to having reverence and respect for who God is. It's having God in His rightful place in your life. So when God is your number one priority, then you're starting to get smart. Then you're starting to be wise. He is the beginning of wisdom. So as you begin to apply the biblical precepts and principles in your life, you learn to trust God. Your trust in God grows abundantly. Your faith will grow abundantly like never before. But it does mean you're going to have to make some tough choices. You're going to have to implement some new spending habits. Old habits are hard to break. Old habits die hard, do they not? Yeah, how many of us have some old habits? that are, They're just tough to break, man. I mean, they, they just hang on like ugly on an ape. But in the long run, God will bless what you do when you do things his way. And you're also storing up for yourself treasure in heaven. And as I said last week, every problem, I don't care what your predicament is today, as you begin to implement God's word into your life, God will guide you out of your present problem or predicament. It may take some time. It'll take some persistence. You didn't get in this hole overnight. You're not going to get out of it overnight. <clears throat> All right. Now, we got into last week, and I want to continue uh, where we left off. One of the basic biblical principles on money is tithing. Now, I want you to get this concept. Because a lot of people, if you know nothing about what the Bible says about money, when they hear a pastor or a preacher talk about money, they just kind of shut down. Oh, he's talking about money again. I really don't talk about it that often. If you've been here very long, you know that I don't. But you do need to understand God's purpose in your tithing. And I'm going to show you the process by which you can get there within your ability of, um, of faith and trust, all right? So let's go back to Malachi chapter 3, verses 8 through 11. And we'll recap here a little bit. It says, Will a man rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, how do we rob you? In tithes and offerings. You are under a curse, the whole nation of you, because you are robbing me. 
Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you will not have room enough for it. I will prevent pests from devouring your crops and the vines in your fields will not cast their fruit, says the Lord Almighty. Now, as we read here, what is God's purpose in our tithing? Verse 10 says, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Now, I, I want to look at this verse in light of the Old Testament and in light of today, the New Testament. The storehouse was where the food, the Levites would uh, tithe all their grains, their uh, animals, uh, even financial, uh, their money and whatnot. They would bring their tithes to the storehouse. The storehouse uh, was where they stored the, the nation of Israel. They would store up all of their tithes. The Levites were... There's 12 tribes of Israel. The Levites were the ones that were responsible down through the centuries of uh, doing the sacrifices for their sins that was required. They were also responsible for the teaching of, of the Mosaic Law uh, and promoting God's ways in all of their living and all of their teachings and whatnot. They, in essence, <coughs> uh, taught uh, salvation in the Old Testament. And as uh, the tithes were uh, brought in, it was put into the storehouses so that there was food in God's house, so that the gospel could continue to be uh, taught in the Old Testament. Now, Jesus alluded to this very thing as well in Matthew 23, verse 23. He said, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin. But you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. <coughs> so Jesus said you should have practiced the more important matters of the law. What's more important? Justice, mercy, and faithfulness. He says you should have practiced the latter, justice, mercy, and faithfulness, without neglecting the former. What's the former? The tithe. Don't neglect your tithing, but more important, practice justice, mercy, and faithfulness. So he's saying, do both. Don't forget either one. Now, it's exactly today in the New Testament as it was in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, God's way of promoting the gospel was through the Levites. Today in the New Testament, it is through the ministry of the church. Now, let me ask you a very simple question. Is God still all about promoting the gospel? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, now more than ever. Now more than ever before. Without the church sending out missionaries or evangelists, the gospel would not be preached. Without pastors and teachers within the church, the gospel would not be preached. All ministries, today in the New Testament, all ministries begin within the church and branch out from the local church. Without your tithes, there would be nothing in the storehouse for ministries to subsist on. We would not have church services or outreaches without tithers. Now, let me just be frank. I, as your pastor, live off the tithes from within this church body. This is my job. Paul alludes to this, 1 Timothy 5.17. He says, the elders, now when he's talking about elders, he's talking about pastors, pastors only. The elders who direct the affairs of the church well are worthy of double honor, especially those whose work is preaching and teaching. For the scripture says, do not muzzle the ox while it is treading out the grain. Never thought of myself as an ox, but hey, that works. And the worker deserves his wages. So pastors, elders, earn their wages from within the church. Now, where do these wages come from? From the giving of the people within the church. Now, if you are getting fed here, you should give here. Let me address some funny concepts without anybody being offended. Because some people have a funny concept when it comes to church. Some have imagined that everything about the church is free. Pastors work for, for free. People do things for free. Teach for free. 
just out of curiosity, how many of y'all work for free? That's what I thought. If you work for free, it's called volunteering. <laughs> no, you, you, you put in, you know, 40 hours a week at your, at your job. And uh, let's say you go into your job and you've just finished your, your week and your boss says, good job, here's your paycheck for this week. And you say, oh, thanks, boss, but, but no thanks, no thanks. I just like being here so well. You're such a great guy. The people I work with, they're so wonderful. I mean, I can't think of anything I'd rather do with my day than get up early, make the drive, come in to work, put in eight hours a day, and uh, it's just a pleasure and a joy for me to be here and go home. No, keep your money. Do whatever you want with it. I just want to be here. So, has anybody found that place? No. No, you don't do that. Uh, nobody works for free. As I said, you know, some people volunteer and that's fine. <clears throat> but without those who tithe, there would just simply be no church whatsoever. The church could not exist without its tithers. Uh, without tithers, you would, the, best that would, the best thing that would happen, we'd have a Bible study here and there, but that would be it. There would be no ministries happening because all ministries begin within the local church. You would have no building to meet in. You would not have consistent teaching and preaching. The apostles earned their living and their being able to travel through the giving of the local churches. So it is bringing the tithes into the storehouse so that there is food in God's house, so that there is ministry happening within God's house. That's what your tithes do. And it's the same, exact same principle in the New Testament as it was in the Old Testament. Anybody ever go to a restaurant, you order a meal, eat it, it's a good meal, and you get up and leave without paying for it? No, you wouldn't think of doing that. If you did, it's called dine and ditch, and it's illegal. <laughs> uh, is it somehow any different when you go to church? Why is it we're willing to pay to eat out? We, we're willing to pay to watch television. We're willing to pay to go to the movies. We're willing to pay to go to a concert and listen to a singer sing their songs. We're willing to pay to go to a, a fight and watch two guys duke it out, either in a ring or in a cage. I love MMA, by the way. And I do pay to watch it. Why is it that we have this concept that it's, we pay for all these other things, but somehow we don't want to pay when we go to church? Now, we don't charge anybody to come to church, and I don't want you to get the wrong idea. I just want you to challenge your mindset uh, if that is your thinking. Yeah, we don't, ministry is free. We don't charge anyone to come to church. You can continue to come and not give a penny or pay a dime or do anything. Like I said last week, I really don't care whether you give or not because it doesn't affect me, but it does affect you. And I'm wanting you to understand God's purpose in your giving so that your life can be blessed, so that God can minister and do things through you. It doesn't affect me, so I have no, no dog in this fight. God really does supply all my needs. But as I said last week, if you are saved today, it is because somebody tithed many years ago. Think about it. Where did you hear the gospel? You either heard it from a friend who themselves were saved, or you went to a church service, heard the gospel, and got saved. But without somebody tithing many years before, you would have never would have heard the gospel. If you heard it through a friend, they never would have heard it. So if they didn't hear it, you wouldn't have heard it. If you got saved in a church without tithers, there would be no church, so you wouldn't have gotten saved there either. Just think down the line. You are saved because somebody gave and tithed many years ago. Without a church, there would have been no pastor. Without a pastor, there'd be no one preaching and teaching to God's people. Like I said, the best thing that would be happening would it'd be a Bible study here and there. But how many you know, we're not going to evangelize the world by a few Bible studies. It's not going to happen. Not at that rate. <clears throat> now, I also understand that my gifting as a pastor teacher will make room for itself. Proverbs 18, 16 says, A man's gift makes room for him and brings him before great men. I'm assuming that since you are here, you probably at least somewhat can stomach or you like my preaching. Okay, that's great. My style of preaching is not for everybody. Some people like a different style, a different format, and that's good. That's great. As long as they're getting fed, that's all I care about. Um, <clears throat> how many of you know who Keith Urban is? 
Uh, he's a very gifted guitar player, uh, singer. And he was, uh, I, this one time, we, my wife and I were watching this uh, singing show. He was a judge on one of these uh, singing shows. But he was sharing one time when uh, he was talking to Glenn Campbell. How do you know who Glenn Campbell is? All right, most of you do, Glenn Campbell. These younger generation, who's these guys he's talking about? <laughs> Glenn Campbell, he died like three years ago. Uh, Glenn Campbell was probably the most gifted, phenomenal guitar, guitar player I've ever seen or ever heard. I mean, this guy could make a guitar sing. He was good. Anyway, uh, Keith Urban was sharing a time when Glenn Campbell gave him three words of advice. And this is what Glenn Campbell said to Keith Urban. He said, perfect your craft. And Keith Urban shared that, and he says, that inspired me. He says, that just made me want to be a, a better player. And, it, and when, it, when Keith Urban said that, I thought, you know, that's really good advice. I, I like that. I mean, he wasn't even talking about anything churchy or religious uh, when he said that. <clears throat> now, and I just thought, you know, as a, as a pastor and as a teacher, I want to perfect my craft. Not that I'm here to tickle anyone's ears, but I always want to appeal to as many people as possible. Like the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 9.22, To the weak I became weak to win the weak. I have become all things to all men so that by all possible means I might save some. I do this for the sake of the gospel that I may share in its blessings. You know, Paul, and that's what he's saying, he was all about perfecting his craft as an apostle. Uh, he, just, he wanted to do everything possible, by all means possible, um, to win those for Christ. I thought, yeah, I, I want to perfect my craft. I want to perfect my ability to win souls and being, bring people to Christ and, and to be able to teach them and appeal to them in a way that ministers to their needs. And <clears throat> I think the church needs to be relevant to the people it is trying to reach. We need to be relevant. Our times are changing. Now, understand, we never change the gospel. We don't water it down. We don't compromise uh, its teachings uh, just to appeal to more people. I'm not about that at all. I'm not all about compromise in any way, shape, or form. But we do need to understand the times in which we live. You know, I mean, we have our sermons online, uh, both audio and video, and on the radio. <coughs> um, we are doing everything possible to reach as many possible. Now, we could try doing the busing thing like we did in the 70s, but I don't think that is relevant today. Uh, you know, somebody here not too long ago said, you know, we need to have revival meetings like we did in the early 1900s. I don't think that because I don't think that is relevant to the times in which we live. <clears throat> uh, we live in the technological age. I don't think kids play Pong anymore. How many of you know what that game is? <laughs> yeah. Or Asteroids or Pac-Man. <laughs> my my nine-year-old grandson beats me at Street Fighter now, you know, on the video games. How many of you know what Street Fighter is? <laughs> Three of us, all right. All right. <laughs> yeah. No, but we need to be relevant in the times in which we live. And so, like I said, we don't change the gospel, but we might need to change the ways in which we get the gospel out. Can you put a price on a soul? Yes and no. Let me tell you what I mean. A soul is priceless. Y yeah, you, you can't purchase somebody's salvation. In that sense, it is priceless. But yet there is a monetary cost in bringing someone to Christ. Let me give you an example. Uh, uh, many of you probably remember the Billy Graham crusades uh, over the last uh, you know, half a century while he was still alive. Was there a, a financial cost for all of those crusades? Absolutely. There were, were salaries that needed to be paid and the cost of renting stadiums and hiring workers and, and telephone workers. and what, They had a lot of volunteer work, but they also had a staff uh, that was involved that needed to be paid. In fact, if you were to compute that in today's economy and the cost of things, uh, let, me, let me put it in terms you understand. Last, in the last several years, the, the giving has been 
fairly consistent. Every year, Americans give $50 billion to charities and churches. Now, you also may be aware that church attendance, and I'm just speaking as a whole in America, church attendance is on the decline. Uh, in other words, if you consider the birth rate in America, and it's about, there are 4 million babies born in America every year, uh, we're losing. In other words, not enough people are getting saved to even keep up with the birth rate. So church attend as a percentage, church attendance is on the decline, and we're not even keeping even with the birth rate. But when you consider all that, the average of decline in church attendance versus the giving and all that, it costs about $15,000 to bring one person to Christ. That's how it computes out. And this is why God implements the principles of giving and tithing so that there is food in God's house, so that there is ministry happening within the church. That's what that principle means, to put it in today's vernacular. So that the gospel can be taught and preached and sent out. Now, I don't know if you've noticed, but the world is all about getting their message out. Are they not? There was $14 billion spent on just this last presidential election. The Democrats spent twice as much as the Republican Party on their campaign. When you factor in all the TV ads, radio ads, internet ads, all that junk mail you got, aren't you glad that's over with? All that junk mail you've been getting, all the rallies, all the debates they've had, all the people they've hired making phone calls and mail advertisements, all that. There was $14 billion spent. Why? Why was there so much money spent on a presidential election? Because each party wanted to get their message out. How do you know what the Democratic Party stands for? Do you guys not know what the Democratic Party stands for, what they're promoting? They spent $9 billion getting the message out. Did you not hear it? How do you know what the Republican Party's message was all about? Okay. Regardless of which party you're for, we understand their message because they spent a lot of money getting their message out. You heard about it in all kinds of newscasts and radio shows and whatnot. It's been talked about for the last year or two. Now, how many of you know that we, the church, have a message we want to get out to the public? We have a message. Democrats, did, they did a good job getting their message out and across the Republic. The Republicans, they did a good job getting their message out and across. We have a message that we need to get out to the world. Is that just going to happen? Are we just going to all going to be able to think and osmosisly everyone will get that message? No, it doesn't happen that way, does it? Now, I want to bring out another principle here in Malachi that God says in verse 10. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Notice the next four, four words God says, test me in this. God says, test me. Well, I, I, Pastor, I thought we weren't supposed to put God to the test. I mean, it's what Jesus said, right? I mean, Matthew chapter 4, when the devil was tempting Jesus, the first temptation, he said, turn these stones to bread. And Jesus said, it is written, man shall live by shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. That was the first temptation. And the second temptation, we read in verse 5, Matthew 4, it says, Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Well, what is it? Do we put God to the test or don't we? No, we don't put God to the test. Except in this one area. God says, test me in this. It's the only area, the, the only clause, if you will, that God says, don't put me to the test. Except in the area of tithing. In that area, I do want you to put me to the test. Why? So in other words, if you walked out and you got a, 
speeding train coming your way and you stood right in the middle of the train tracks and you said, God, if you love me, stop this train from hitting me. That's putting God to the test. And if you did that, you'd be the next hood ornament on that train. If you jumped off the Empire State Building and on the way down you said, God, if you love me, catch me. You'll make your next mark in society on that sidewalk with a stain, all right? That's putting God to the test. That's violating the laws of physics, and you're putting God to the test when you do that. And the Bible says, it is written, do not put the Lord your God to the test, except in this area. And God says, do. Do test me. Test me in this. Now, why does God want us to test him when it comes to our tithing? It's a good question. Now, here's a question. What, more than anything else in the world, does God want for the human race? 2 Peter 3.9 answers this question. It says, The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Getting the gospel out is God's number one priority. He doesn't want one single soul to perish. He doesn't want anyone going to hell. He wants everyone to come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. He wants everyone to come to repentance. That's God's whole purpose, goal, number one priority. Does God care about the car you drive? Does he care about the house you live in? Does he care about how many zeros in your bank account? That's not important. Is that going to matter 100 years from now? Not one of those things is going to matter 100 years from now. Is your eternity going to matter? Absolutely. Now, I want you to think of this in terms of God's economy. Why does God want to bless your finances? And you need to understand he does want to bless your finances. Does it not say that in Malachi? See if I will not pour out so much blessing that you will not have enough room for it. Why? Why does God want to do that? So that you can give or sow into the kingdom of God. And as you do, as you are obedient in your giving, what happens? The gospel is taught. It is preached. It is sent forth. Missionaries are sent forth. Evangelists are sent forth. Ministries begin to happen and produce fruit. The message of the gospel gets told. See, that's the message of the gospel. That's what the Bible's all about. That's what God's all about. God's all about people getting saved, coming to a saving knowledge of who Jesus is. And when you tithe, you are operating on spiritual law when you do that. It is an act of faith. Now, I don't know if you remember this, but if you were here two weeks ago, I read a verse and I told you I would come back to this verse later on. This is later on. And it was Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse 26. To the man who pleases him, God gives wisdom, knowledge, and happiness. But to the sinner, he gives the task of gathering and storing up wealth to hand it over to the one who pleases God. This too is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. So back to where we started a few weeks ago. Who is the one who pleases God? The one who is doing the will of God. Make sense? <clears throat> Do you really think that God just wants you to accumulate a bunch of stuff so that you can indulge all your earthly desires on things? No, that's not what he's about. Or do you think God might want to use you to promote the gospel? To be a blessing to others and to help others in need? Yeah, it's probably that one. Proverbs 3, 9 and 10. Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing and your vats will brim over with new wine. So how do we honor God with our wealth? If I were to ask you, what is it that you do with your money that honors God? How would you answer that question? You might say, hey, you know, I give to our, our youth fund so that kids can go to Generation Unleashed uh, for a few days and hear the gospel that they wouldn't normally hear. That would be honoring God with your wealth. Or I give to Heart to Heart Ministry so that orphan kids in Honduras have a safe place to live and hear the gospel. That would be honoring God with your wealth. 
Or you might say, I give to my local church so that Pastor Brett can keep preaching the awesome word that he does so Christians like me can grow in faith and learn to do ministry. That would be honoring God with your money. See, it's people who are ministry-minded, who are focused on others, doing the will of God, who are the ones who please God. Those are the kinds of people whose finances God wants to bless because you are doing what God wants done with your finances. Now, are you blessed in the process of blessing others? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you're a recipient of blessing others, and it's, there's a byproduct to where you're blessed in return. And God blesses you with more than what you have. Not so that you just have a bunch of stuff, but it's all about ministry. Proverbs 11.24 says, One man gives freely, yet gains even more. Another withholds unduly, but comes to poverty. A generous man will prosper. He who refreshes others will himself be refreshed. Now, remember this principle. The hand that is closed to give to God is also closed to receive from God. Now, one little girl really caught on to this concept. Uh, she and her, her mother, they lived in a small Midwestern town. And they were at the, you know, just this little small town. They're at the local mercantile shop buying their groceries for the next couple of weeks. And the store owner of this little small grocery store in this small town, the store owner kept this large jar, this glass jar of jelly beans right there by the cash register when people were checking out their groceries. And the store owner happened to notice this little eight-year-old girl eyeing that jar of jelly beans. And he asked her if she would like some jelly beans. Big smile came on her face, and being a little timid, she just simply nodded her head, yes. And the store owner took the lid off the glass jar and held it down to her level. He says, put your hand in and grab a, a, a fistful of jelly beans. And the shy little girl, she just kind of stood there, but she didn't reach in the jar to grab the jelly beans. He was a little surprised, and he asked her again, are you, are you sure you want some jelly beans? And again, she smiled and nodded yes. But she wouldn't reach her hand in the, and grab a handful of jelly beans. The store owner just kind of chalked it up as to her being a little shy and bashful. So he reached in, grabbed a big handful of jelly beans, and placed them into her hands. When her mother and uh, the little girl got out to the car and they're driving away, the mom was a little surprised at her daughter because she said, oh, she's not that bashful. And she said, well, why didn't you reach your hand in and grab a handful of jelly beans? He was offering it to you. And the daughter with a smile on her face replied, because his hands are bigger than mine. And when you understand the heart of God and his purposes in regards to your finances, you'll start to catch on what God is wanting to do in your life. He wants to bless your finances so that you can bless others, so that you can promote ministry, so that you can finance missionaries and evangelists and more ministries within the church, through the church. And I want to challenge you this morning to begin testing God in the area of tithing if it isn't already your practice. Now, people have said, yeah, but pastor, you know, I'm just not sure if I'm there yet. I mean, I don't know. That's a big step of faith for me. I'm barely making ends meet as it is today with everything going on. I can barely keep my head afloat or meet my financial obligations right now. Pastor, I'm so poor, I can't even pay attention. I want to give you a challenge that anyone can begin with. No matter what, giving is important to start. Now, if 10% seems impossible for you at this time, start with 1%. Start with a half a percent if you need to. It looks like this. Throw up my, my little math chart here. So let's just, I'm just picking numbers out of the air here. If your income is $5,000 a month, your tithe, which means 10, that's what it means a tenth, would be 10%, would be 500 a month. But if that's too big of a step, you say, man, I just, uh, you know, I, I'm not there. I mean, I'm paycheck to paycheck as it is. Start with 1%. 1% of 5,000 would be 50 bucks. 
Not a huge stretch for anybody, I don't think, and not in this economy. But if even that is too much of a stretch, do a half a percent. One half a percent of 5,000 is 25 bucks. Most of us waste more than that every month. But whatever it is, start where you can. But do try and stretch yourself. And no, 25 cents is not stretching yourself. I find more than that on the sidewalk every week, all right? Stretch yourself. Step out in faith. But the key here is to be faithful and consistent where you start. Now, here's, here's the plan. It's so easy. Do that for three months. If you can start with 1%, do 1%. If that's a stretch, do a half a percent with your income. But just be consistent and faithful for three months. You will need to be intentional about it, have a plan in place. You know, if you're just kind of willy-nilly about it or you're not serious about it, you'll fizzle out in a month or two. But I promise you, after three months, here's what you're going to find. Wow, you know, I've been given 1% of my income to God's work and to ministry, and I'm no worse off. In fact, if you're asking God along the way to bless your finances, because your goal is to get to where the scripture says you need to be, God, I'm working on being toward that 10%. I want to be obedient to the word of God. I want to be faithful. God, if you will help me, I will be faithful. And you will find God will be faithful as you step out in faith. Start with 1%. Start with a half percent. Start where you can. It's just important to start. And you're going you're to find, you know what? I've been doing 1% and I haven't been any worse off and God's been faithful to me. I'm going to step it up from 1% to 1.5% or even from 1% to 2%. But do that for the next three months. Every three months, change it up 1% or a half a percent. And you will find that God will be faithful to you in this area. I've been making a promise. I've been here 27 years and I've been making this promise. My board supports me and backs me in this promise. My promise is this. If you tithe consistently and faithfully for one year, and at the end of that one year, you find that God has not done what he has promised to do in Malachi 3.10, I will refund every penny you have given to the church with interest. No questions asked. How can I make such a promise? Because I am not the one who is blessing your finances. God is. And you cannot outgive God. Can you give me one example in your life where God has not followed through on any of his promises in the Bible? And I would say, no, you cannot prove to me where God has not been faithful to you in any one of his promises. This is just one of them. God is faithful to us even when we are not faithful to him. In 27 years, I've been making this promise. You know, you know how many times I've had to refund somebody's tithe? Zero. Because God honors all of his promises to us. Start wherever you can in your giving, but do start. Start today. Your faith will take on new challenges. You're probably going to tick the devil off, but that's all right. Because God will... Your faith is going to grow like never before. Your trust in God is going to grow like never before. You'll feel good about your, your walk with God because now you're starting to be obedient to the word of God. And God, you need to understand, God wants to bless your finances because now you understand why. Because ministries are happening. People are getting saved. Just think about for every $15,000 you give, somebody comes to know Christ. That might help your giving concept of wealth. Do you want people to come to know who, Jesus, know who Jesus is? I think you do. I do. And if by my giving, ministry happens, yeah. I mean, it's, in that sense, it's monetary. It takes money to, to get the gospel out, to get the message out. You're just doing what God wants you to do in the saving of souls. All right. I'm going to stop there, and we'll continue in two weeks. Next week, we have Bob Laughlin. Father, we thank you for the word of God this morning. And I pray more than uh, just as to the message this morning, God, that we truly understand your purpose with our finances and in our giving, that you want to bless us so that ministry happens, so that people hear who Jesus is, that they have a Savior who loves them and died for them, 
and desires them to have eternal life and a relationship with their Heavenly Father. God, that's the message that we proclaim. That is the message we want to get out. And how we, however we need to do that, we want to be relevant to the times in which we live. We want to be faithful stewards of the finances you entrusted to us. Help us to live by faith and to step out in faith. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Strength arises, we wait upon the Lord. Wait upon the Lord, we will wait.